Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here with author and teacher Holly Lyle. And today's episode is a part two of 11 Common Stereotypes, How to Make Them Real People. Uh, before, as, as always, before we get into the topic, we wanted to talk about what we did this week. So Holly, go ahead. Okay. Um, all right. Well, well, I'm doing four, four projects now. Uh, I'm doing how to write a novel, the class, and I finished lesson 21 and started lesson 22. Um, on Dead Man's Party, which is the novel that I'm writing for the class, uh, I got my 1,515 words. I hit the midpoint of the novel, and I am now pl- plotting forward a little bit towards uh, what can possibly go wronger than what has already gone wrong, which is fun. Um, <clears throat> on the Wishbone Conspiracy, I have now about two-thirds of the novel outlined, and I'm not entirely certain how much of it's going to stay. I'm really, really, really excited about the ending, which I figured out one morning when I just I woke up and knew how it had to end, and so I am plotting toward that. Um, and I I have what feels a little bit like some dead space in some of what I've gotten. So as I write through, a lot of this is going to be subject to change. But, okay, on the the third thing, I'm also writing The Wishbone Conspiracy for two or more hours a week. And last week, I wrote over 4,000 words. Uh, So I now have about 5,000 words on the book, which is planned for 90,000 words. And I am really, really happy with what I'm getting. This is a book that has been running through my head for, well, since I finished um, War Paint. So I don't remember what year that was, but it has been, I, I knew the next book I wanted to write when I finished War Paint, and I am now finally getting to write it. So it has been just an awesome week. <laughs> And you said that uh, it's 90,000 words. I thought you were shooting with the Katie's to be 50 or 60,000. My first Katie, I, I went through and looked. My first Katie was in 90. My my war paint was longer. It was really big. But I'm going back to the 90s because that's the, the length at which I have my rhythm for her voice and I don't have to leave things out. So uh, I, I figured I did all my by book map. <laughs> I did yeah. all my book math. Let me say that very clearly. I have it up on my blog uh, for this week, and uh, it shows me figuring out uh, how many words I needed to get per day and how many words, if I got my words per day on the two days a week that I'm writing this, uh, when I could have it done. I think I have it done around July 25th. <laughs> so, That's cool. Yeah, two days a week, um, 2,000 words a day. I uh, have the first draft of the novel done in, in mid-July to late July. Nice. Yeah, while writing two other books and a class. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah, How to Write a Novel has been a breakthrough class for me in just showing me what that what I am actually capable of doing if I stay focused and, and have everything in my bullet journal. <laughs> awesome Yeah, the tool. bullet journal is something new. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's an awesome tool. Okay, so that was me. What's up with you? Um, well, I sort of did the opposite of you. I condensed and took on only one project because, um, I think I, I wrote like, um, two days of this week, Mm -hmm. just the first two Monday and Tuesday, I believe it was. And I got, you know, over 2000 words, um, per, per time. I think it was. So I, I've, it's kind of like your, your, um, Katie was what I did with. The second book in the Wanda Lucia series. And um, I also hit this moment of realization, like, I don't know how much of this I actually want to continue doing, mm-hmm. the Wanda Lucia stuff. It's, it's something that if I had only done when I was in my 20s, you know, when I was thinking up all of these things or even um, my earliest 30s, 
if I had stuck with actually writing and not letting my fear take over and, and all this stuff, I could have gotten a whole lot of this, this out of me. But it's at this point, between everything else that I'm working on and just all of these realizations of, you know, how short life is, <laughs> I, I'm just stuck at this point in my head where I just want to work on Fulton Hills and Glass House and Standing River and, and all of this stuff. And I, I love the stories that I'm telling in, in Wanda Lucia. It's not that I don't love the characters. It's not that I don't think they're important stories. No, but, and you're writing stuff that is good and original. You, you, you are. Well, and, and I still want to, oh, I appreciate that too. <laughs> um, I still want to write uh, one more story because I, I feel like it's a really, really important story that I wanted to tell. But I think maybe Wanda Lucia might be capped at three. I might go back into the world if I'm feeling like writing <laughs> one of those again. But I don't know, man. I just... The life is so short, and I just want to write stuff with magic and ghosts and cryptids, and and I think part of um, what's really, really motivating me is the podcast, because um, every week we get together and we talk about this stuff, and it just helps keep that passion flowing, even when I'm going through those those depressive depressive stages and stuff yeah um but yeah so that was the one project and the one really big moment where everything just kind of hit me in the head telling me like you know <laughs> yeah listen to that yeah yeah that was that was where I finally flung myself whole hog on into the whole Caden Drake thing again because that's that's my love that's yeah. the, that's uh, that that whole world. I love that world. I could write in that world for a, a million years and never run out of stories. <laughs> yeah, and that see, that's also the the thing that I realized. Like maybe it's better that I didn't get so whole into this in my late twenties, early thirties, or even mid twenties, because maybe then I would be stuck in this um, romance kind of place. Even though I came up with. Fulton Hills when I was like 19 maybe that would be pigeonholing me and I'm looking at you and you have to write you know the Emerald Sun because yeah you want to know what happens and I promised <laughs> yeah I was gonna uh. say you got people waiting for that book and it's keeping it's it's like it's part of you but it's also keeping you from from what you really really would prefer to be diving into not now it isn't because oh, now, now you're yeah because now i'm working simultaneously on that oh and yeah. wishbone conspiracy so yeah just just like yeah. i said the, the but i don't want to do that <laughs> yeah no 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 i have no interest in in writing yeah there's three books a, a week oh my god well it's <laughs> it's crazy it's crazy but uh but the main thing for for my week was I finally finished the new cover for Hunting the Corrigan's Blood. <laughs> yeah. And Mom is dancing. You I guys am. can't see her, but yeah. I she's... am. It's done. It's done. I've got it. And I'm going to do a little sneak peek reveal of part of the cover for, for you guys and for my guys in Patreon and for my guys uh, on my website, on my personal blog on Tuesday. The day this, well, no, the, the day... Well, Tuesday would be coming out, right? So would when well, is it coming out? Well, it's going to come out as close to Tuesday as I can get, but uh, I do have to go through the bug hunt, which is part oh, yeah. of tomorrow. Um, and it won't be coming out in paperback until a week after because that's what, you know, Amazon, you, you put stuff up and it takes about a week for it to go live. But uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no edi new edition, um, all bug hunted and it, it, as as clean as I can make it. I was super, super happy to have done the cover. I worked my ass off on it. I'm very pleased with it. I thought it was really cool. Um, it's not perfect, but it's it's definitely the best work that I've done as far as coming up with, with a concept and not working from reference necessarily, you know? Yeah. 
No, nobody. So I've I've always drawn from reference before, almost always exclusively, you know, for the most part. But this was really cool because it also showed me that I can do the cryptid designs that I want to do. Oh, yeah. So. Oh, yeah. You've still got this. All right. So let's get into the 11 common stereotypes, how to make them real people. And remember as well that if you have another stereotype we have not talked about, everything we talk about is is not inclusive to the ones we're talking about you, you can use it every single stereotype right okay so to get us started on this i'm going to go again through the list of questions um and the first question what's wrong with the character the answer to that is the stereotype um so that's when when you are looking at a character that only has one notes one one note that is the problem with the character Okay, the next questions then are what's necessary with this character, what is outside of the expected that motivates this character, what does this character secretly desire, what is this character's greatest point of pain, what is this character's greatest passion, and what secret has this character been hiding from you. And these will give you characters with real depth. Now, um, you don't have to do this for, for a character who has no name, who is standing in line behind two important characters in a shopping line or something like that. If you just have, you can have people who are just there. They don't need to matter. They don't need to mean anything. They're just kind of there to fill up space so that your background isn't empty. But here's the rule. If you give the character a name, then that character needs two or more notes. It can't just be the ditzy friend or the comic relief side tra- sidekick or the angsty teen. This character needs to have some other thing because if you give the character a name, you are promising your reader that that character matters in some way. So now, I do like the idea of um, the the characters um, if they're if they're there and and they are one note because they're there to act as filler i think it's important to to note this that um the better writing like the way that uh you you have done that i've noticed um is to still give that person a point in how the main character reacts so if you have a ditzy teen or a ditzy um friend and the main character um is finding her humorous or if you have an angsty teen and the main character is uh, wanting to punch him in his face because he's all emo. I mean, that shows a lot about the character without telling that person like, oh, I hate emo kids. You know? Yes. Yes. So these guys have a good reason for existing, even as one note characters. Yeah. Uh, you, you can have two friends standing in line waiting to, to check out and the, the ditzy blonde or the, the ditzy character behind them goes, oh my God. And both of the, the, the main character and the friend roll their eyes. Yeah. And that tells yeah. you basically all you need to know and you don't have to give the character behind them a name and that's valid. You know, that mm-hmm. is a useful thing to do with a ditzy friend or a ditzy character. But let's go a little deeper now. Uh, let's say that you're main character's best friend is the ditzy friend then you're going to look at some way to give first off you know she's going to have a name so right there she meets the rule for must have two notes so then you're going to look at well what really matters about her if she's if she's ditzy why does that affect the story um does she do something incredibly goofy stupid like leave the door unlocked to let the cat or the dogs go in and out by themselves um with uh and and while she is babysitting her friend's pets and somebody breaks into the house and steals everything because she did this so why why does it matter that she's ditzy and if you, what's the, the other thing that you need to know then, the second characteristic is, well, okay, she screwed up. So how does she deal with that? She can't deal with it by being ditzy. She needs to be something a little deeper now. And what could she do? You know, does she manage to, to round up people? Is she, does she show some organizational skills and some spunk in, in ga- getting donations for her friend who got robbed, uh, in getting all the animals gathered back up again, uh, in, you know, coming in and doing something that's, that's more than just being a doof. 
Um, or it, what does, what's outside of what you expect from her that motivates her? Let's say that she loves to shop. But what more is there to her? Does she have this secret passion for something that she is subliminating because shopping is easy and this thing that she wants so much in her life is hard and she's afraid to go for it and she's afraid to try it. So she has her, her job and she does her shopping and she dreams about this thing that she's going to do someday and she's not ever going to do it until something kicks loose and all of a sudden she realizes, man, I got to. Um, at which point she starts becoming a main character and probably gets her own book. <laughs> um, so with each of these, you know, that, that I'm not going to go through all of the questions with each of the characters because that's where we ran into trouble last time. Yeah. That's why this is a two-parter. Yes. Yes. So with that said, you, you have your ditzy friend or you have your goofy guy, um, well, who, it would be kind of, I guess, the, the, like we talked about before, the, the male version of, of a ditzy friend could, could be the, um, the dude's dude, kind yeah. of, because the, there's this, um, the blonde chick is the ditzy, the ditzy chick, right? So, yes. And then the, the tool guy or, or the, you know, yes. the sports guy, the, yeah, the, you know. <laughs> the guy who is recognized only by his feet and boots because he is invariably underneath the car with his legs <laughs> sticking out yeah there we go yeah so yeah. you know that's he he needs to have a little bit more than that um, well i think it, it would be cool too to make the ditzy friend and this is just me but you know like there's that facade uh, yeah she's kind of clumsy yeah she she enjoys shopping she's a little bit of a ditz but she lets people see that side of her and not the real side of her which maybe got hurt when mm -hmm. she was you know vulnerable with somebody yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's, it's a way you can always make these people deeper. And I think that's a lot of fun to play with these stereotypes. Yeah. It yeah. can be. And ditziness as a form of armor is actually very good because people it, it would immediately dismiss that character. Yep. And she could float through life unscathed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So then let's look at the comic relief sidekick then. And this is somebody whose job is to say smart ass, funny things, um, to, uh, to do the dumb shit that the character then has to fix it, This is, well, this is a lot in some ways like the ditzy friend, but, um, comics usually they're smart usually they're intelligent right. they can be sarcastic dry witty yeah but if you want to see this done really well um and, and i don't mean just the stereotype but playing on stereotypes pretty much watch anything joss whedon has done as far as oh, like yeah. um dollhouse i know a lot of people didn't like dollhouse i i loved it dollhouse it's done well um Buffy, obviously, Angel, you know, mm -hmm. especially with Charisma Carpenter's character, uh, Cordelia. Even in the first season, you start to see a little bit of depth there. But Willow was the dork. Xander was the comic relief. And every single one of these stereotypes, um, he plays on them very well. Yeah. So that's, if you haven't seen anything by Joss, yeah. give, it, Firefly give it a shot. Too, man. Yeah. Well, Firefly... Firefly was, there was so much depth to the characters almost instantly. I mean, the more you pay attention to each episode. So, but you still, you sort of have the, the stereotypes. Like, they play on the mechanic is is a woman. Mm -hmm. And she is a bubbly, ditzy woman who is a brilliant mechanic. So that, it's it's almost inherent. The, the tough guy is actually Zoe. So he played with the characters before he even, or the stereotypes before he even, before you even meet them. Yeah. Because the strong, silent type is Zoe. Right. You know? <laughs> Wash was kind of the comic relief. Oh, but definitely. he had so much more depth. Yeah. And, and he was always getting frustrated and angry, and, and he was realistic because in his marriage and with the captain, he was getting frustrated because it's like there are too many, there's one too many husbands in this marriage. Yeah. You know, it's, it's brilliantly done by Joss Whedon. And it's something that if you're having a problem with stereotypes, 
give anything he's he, any of his shows uh, a real watch. Right. Even Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods was almost exclusively meant to play with stereotypes. Yeah. And, and was a fine, fine movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Um, angsty Teen. The, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Um, this is tough because, for one thing, teenagers haven't really completely finished building their brains yet. They haven't been finished creating themselves yet. Um, so it's... But I think it makes it more fun because you can make them angsty and insane and you've got a teenager. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, there, there is a certain amount of truth in that. Um, you you and both of your brothers had interesting teenager <laughs> angsty well, stuff yeah. going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I can remember my teenage years and looking back and just thinking like, it's it's you're certifiable at mm -hmm. that age mm -hmm. you know and and anything is like you've got a hair trigger for any emotion that you have so i think writing an angsty teen you're not playing with the entire playbook if you're just writing that one note character right because teenagers are just this maelstrom of of nutbag oh my god and yeah <laughs> that's i mean when i was <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll skip some of the weirder parts of my teenagerness and just go go to, to when I was in high school. I was I, I fell in and out of love in a heartbeat. It took oh, about yeah. fifteen <laughs> seconds, man. You know, yep. You yep. You're just oh my god, so in love with this guy. Oh my god, so in love with that guy. That guy, the other guy, last week's guy. I don't know, who's he? Yeah. Remember was, the the time I came home um, three days in a row with a new boyfriend? Yes. <laughs> Yes, remember that I was kind of sympathetic about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, because you don't know anything and you think you know everything. Yes, yes. And, and your hormones are ablaze and life is beautiful. And 15 seconds later, <laughs> life is the worst thing ever. Yes, life is, is a tragedy and the world is going to end and I am the center of the universe. And mm -hmm. and you, you look at it from the perspective of, of years later or bunches of years later, and you think, holy shit, I was nuts. Yeah. 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 And also you think you know everything, which yeah. is, yeah, <laughs> which is awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> great because that runs away really fast. You get out into the real world and realize, man, I don't know anywhere near as much as I thought I did. <laughs> and this is hard. Yeah. Well, some if if you're lucky, you realize that. Some people never realize that. Oh, that's, but you have yeah. so much freaking confidence when you're in high school too, or or not even high school, but just as a teenager. Mm -hmm. So, it's even the angsty emo kids. You know, they can they have moments of of the the confidence and and the craziness and and, and the sheer fear that. Yeah, yeah, that, oh my God, the, the world is going to end. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. It's yeah. the worst thing in the world. I'm never going to get over this loss. Yeah, oh God. Oh, oh God. Yes. I still remember coming home that one day, crying over this one kid, this one boy who, it wasn't even my boyfriend. Like, I'd had boyfriends and, uh, like, all of these, I've, I've never actually been broken up with, knock on wood. You know, I've always done the dumping, unfortunately. And, you know, I feel bad for that. But, you know, when you're teenagers, what does it matter? Um, right. It's a, yeah. But, but you don't know that at the time because it yeah. is your whole experience. And yeah. to the teenager, this shit is absolutely real because it's all that's there. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, things that, um, you know like Buffy appeal to you mm -hmm. or you know these 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 movies that just everything seems bigger and brighter and more important because you don't know that how much more is out there you are really really missing out if you write a character like Bella because Bella if you read everything is incredibly one note she's she has a little tiny bit of depth to her, but she's not a fully rounded person. Right. There's so much more that you could do with these characters and just make them the teenagers that, you know, that, that exist. 
Yeah. And and the thing about teenagers too is that there is there is some of it that sticks. Some of the stuff that you discover when you are young is still with you when you are an adult. There was this one guy. And uh yeah, I thought he was gonna be the guy. Uh he showed up on my blog some years later and I was I had by that time been through two divorces and had found Matt. If he had shown up after the second divorce or, you know, if he had shown up after the first divorce. Or even if he had shown up um, after the first divorce or after the second divorce, if Matt had not come to the writers writers meeting. meeting. Yeah. Yeah. If If Matt Matt had had not been completely different out of his character 100% and shown up at some random person's house for a writers meeting. Yeah. You might have ended up with the other dude. (laughs) Well, yeah, because, yeah, he was, because seriously, I mean, you know, I can even look at him now and say, well, yes, in that, in that one aspect, I had really good taste. (laughs) Hey, that's cool. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I I look at, at, at all the rest of the guys I had and some of them were really cool and, and some of them were funny and some of them, but that, that guy, uh, yeah, you know, he, he would have been okay. (laughs) We probably would have still been together. There are things from from being a teenager, you know, if you are a teenager right, listening to this, understand that, yeah, a lot of this stuff that you are experiencing right now is going to look a lot different when you're older, but some of it isn't. Some of it you got right the first time. Some of it you understand, and and that's, you know, you know some of what matters to you, and, you know, you don't necessarily know what you're going to be or who you're going to be, but... I started really teaching myself to draw. I started really, and then I let it go. But if I came back to it, and if you have something, try not to let it go. Try to stick with it no matter how hard it is. Because if I'd have done that, who knows where I'd be now. I just, I can't let myself go into that mindset. But yeah, so. Oh, well, yeah, don't go there. Yeah. (laughs) The Ainsty Teen is such a flat one note for how brilliantly disastrous a teenager character can be right you know (laughs) right yes i mean yeah seriously what joss whedon did with teens in in buffy the vampire slayer was really well done yeah um and yeah okay so then let's move on to the angry jerk okay now again (laughs) this this is sufficient if you've got some asshole behind you in traffic who the the light has not even turned green yet and he's already honking his horn that's all you need to say about him you know we we all have had this person behind us uh that they're so in such a big hurry that you you don't even have a green light yet and they're saying hurry the fuck up um but that's if if you are writing somebody and this is needs to be a character in the book this needs to be someone who actually matters at any point, then you have to look at, well, let's say, okay, what does this character, this angry jerk, secretly desire? Um, and if, if this is someone who desperately wanted, um, I don't know, love, a better job, what you are looking for is more than just that one note, that, that person who flies off the handle in every situation. So, you know, what is this character's greatest point of pain? Um, just, he's had a horrible day, maybe, or he yeah. has a horrible job, or he, he has, you know, he's just, something is going terribly wrong in his life. It and could be he's caring for a loved one who's sick, Yeah, you know? Yes, you know, he might he might have a mother at home with Alzheimer's who is in the end stages. And he is trying to get, he has just this person who is over and watching her, but the person who's over there, he doesn't really know that she's, that, that he, his mother's going to get the best care while he's there. He's hurrying to the grocery store. He's getting stuff. He's heading home. And you're in his way, you know? Yeah. That's, you know, there's, there are reasons why people act the way they are. And some people are just assholes. But yeah, if you watch Bird Box, I think um, while it was not the best thing um, 
ever. <laughs> and it was, um, yeah, d Netflix did a brilliant job paying for all those memes and getting the words out be and, and getting people to, to continue that because that's the only thing I can think of as to why that movie got so popular. It wasn't bad, but they did a good job with an angry jerk character. He was just an angry jerk. He was just an asshole. He did suffer a loss, uh, I believe it was his wife or the love of his life, whatever it was, um, in the in part of Bird Box. Oh, spoilers, by the way. Um, <laughs> but he was just an asshole. He was a piece of shit. But at the same time, what they did with his character at the end there, before his character ended up not being in, in the film anymore, um, fit him. You know, it was, it, he was one of those, and I'm not a fan of John Malkovich. I, I don't, <laughs> don't prefer either. him. He was great in Red, he was great in Con Air, but otherwise he just, he just annoys me. But he was good in this. It okay. fit him, and it was almost like it was his personality, maybe, that he was just this dick, this angry, I don't know, he <laughs> I, he just did it very well. You know, he um, could in real life be the nicest guy in the yeah, world. So yeah, let's totally. <laughs> He could be, he could be just a, a great guy. I don't know. But, um, he, he, he does just... not come off well in most movies. No, but he <laughs> did, he did this character really well. I hated some of the dialogue. I just, it was, it was just this mishmash. It was almost the first draft kind of thing that they just put out. But there were some really good parts to it. And I think that his character as a dickhead as just this angry asshole was really decently done because they didn't try to make him like this this secretly angsty person or this this secretly uh altruistic dude mm -hmm. he was just himself and he was a fully rounded character as just an asshole um so if you haven't seen Bird Box, it's, it's definitely worth a watch. It's not horrible. Um, it's got some cool parts to it. It's a very tense movie, I think. And his character was really cool. I liked that. Okay, cool. All right, so let's go on to the henchmen. Yeah, and yes. we're, we, we're going to the air bunnies around the henchmen there. That's our, our yeah. little air quotes thing. Because a hench, this is this is the person who, who lurks and, and slouches and slides around dark corners and just does the bidding of his master without thought, without question, yes. just, just is totally one note as this unthinking tool for someone else to use. And I, or am, even this, this dude who just enjoys killing people or enjoys breaking in or enjoys torturing people, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, but this is, but ju no, with, specifically with the henchman, though, there's someone who puts him up to it. So, oh, yeah. yeah. No, I'm saying he enjoys doing oh, his yes, work for, he, yes. for the boss. Yeah. Without question, without any qualms, he, he does whatever it is that he needs and, and like he'll grin when he's cutting into a person or some, some crazy shit like yeah. that. If you're going to do that, there has to be a reason and, and people need to, to see more of the character, why is he grinning? What is what made him? Um, you know, and again, if he's just there for ten seconds, he gets no dialogue. He has no name. He can be the guy who just you know, at the bidding of his master. You can kind of even throw in a second of hesitation, like if if you wanted to make him a little bit of a person if if the and and also make the bad guy seem that much worse if he says something like okay we'll go torture this child you can give the the henchman just a second of really and then he goes and he does it which means that even an evil henchman is scared shitless of this this evil bad guy and would rather torture a child which he clearly didn't want to do, uh -huh. then have to suffer the wrath of this bad guy. Yeah. And just that second added a bit of a personality. Right. But it, it it doesn't need to be like the name or anything like that. Right. So let's say that this guy has a secret. Let's say that the henchman is working for the the villain because the villain bought him. And that 
he is to all outwardly he is utterly obedient but let's say that he remembers who he was before and he is waiting for his opportunity to get even i like that too because no matter what he's told to do he has to do it because it's going to eventually lead to his freedom and he's putting his his life it, it's got it's got to be my freedom over everything else and i mm-hmm. can't give away that i'm i'm looking for this spot it um was it secret text that you had a henchman yes yes it was yes and and his weakness was that he had or his his point of humanity was that he had a daughter that the his two brothers didn't know about and he had kept her safe and protected her and uh at the end of the story that played enormously into his actions because he had a choice between killing the two people he had to kill or rescuing his daughter who was suddenly in trouble. And he made the right choice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, she... so see, that's that was a henchman. Yeah. But he had that that depth to him. Yeah. Yeah. So that's you know, he, he made the right choice and the two two main characters survived because of it and everything changed because of that. <laughs> yeah, and he did so nice. at at enormous price. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> some some spoiler spoilers in there. Tiny but... tiny little spoiler. I'm not going to say what happened, but uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so on to the stormtrooper red shirt cannon fodder. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. That 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 is all one character: stormtrooper red shirt cannon fodder. <laughs> and yeah. this is just somebody who shows up so that they can get shot. And you know, you knew when you were watching the Star Trek episode. Oh my God, that guy's going going down with the landing party, and he's wearing a red shirt. Yeah, yeah, because it was it's Spock, Bones, of course, Shatner's in there, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Kirk, and then occasionally Lieutenant Uhura. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that, but usually, and uh, not Chin was his name. What was his name? Sulu. Sulu. Thank God. Why did I think Chin? Um, so you've got, oh, right, because of Hawaii Five-0. Oh, mind. okay. <laughs> so you've, you've got Bones, uh, Sulu, you've got Spock, you've got Kirk, and then you've got Dan. Yes. <laughs> or Bob. Yes. Or John. You know, and they did usually, you know, they gave him a name of some sort. Mm-hmm. And it was... <laughs> For eight minutes. <laughs> yes. And I swear, Galaxy Quest is the funniest damn movie because you watch that thing and Guy is like, what is my last name? You don't know. And then it's my, honest to God, my favorite thing ever. And like, I say this all the time and Tony, it actually makes Tony laugh most of the time, is when they land and Guy, they're in this little shuttle and it's uh, three of the main characters and then Guy's in there and they open up the, the door and he's like, is there air? You don't know. <laughs> You know, it's, he was the dude that was pointing out all of the shit that was wrong in all of these Star Trek episodes. Yes. And it was done so well. Yes, it was. It was, God, I love that movie. We have watched that movie a hundred times, I swear. Yeah, well, Joe was a big fan, so I remember seeing it at least, you know, 10,000 times (laughs) in two years. But it was... It was just so well done, and they made fun of of that whole red shirt thing, mm-hmm. while still and, being deeply sympathetic and and, yes. and obviously fans of the original show. Oh yeah, yeah, so, huge fans. Yeah, <laughs> so you know how how do you not love that movie? <laughs> yeah, well, it, and then you look at you know all the stormtroopers; they all look the same, they all act the same, they mm-hmm. march in place, they cannot they shoot for cannot shit, cannot shoot. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's if, if if I'm ever in trouble, I want to be the enemies to be stormtroopers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They just everybody misses, and that's actually one thing that drives me nuts in a lot of TV shows is because mm-hmm. these you know like professional assassins or these cops or every and nobody ever hits the target. No, no, they they shoot fifteen twenty shots out yeah. of you know six shot guns. And <laughs> yeah, uh, and and nobody gets hit. And I'm saying, really, <laughs> really? Yeah, burn burn notice. I think did really well because you know when they pulled out the guns, usually they they would hit the target or yeah. you know. But a lot of the time, it was how do we not use guns? So burn notice was pretty cool. But 
Yeah, so how would you go about making one of these guys, obviously we know if, if, if they have a name, if they have a reason for being important. Yeah. You know, for all of the other characters, but with these guys. There was one episode of Star Trek, and I, I don't remember the episode name, but I remember there was one shirt, one guy, red shirt, who went down. And generally after they got shot, you never saw anything about them again. But when they brought him back, they, they, when they were back on the ship, they showed him lying in state, um, and they showed his, his girlfriend or his fiance or whatever with him crying over the body. And that gave him that tiny, tiny bit of depth. You know, yes, sometimes it is the job of a character to go and die. Sometimes that is why that character exists. But sometimes that but but if so we have to know why that character mattered because yeah. just sending somebody down to the to the surface and killing them is meaningless if we don't have a connection to them that is more than well okay we feel bad for them because they were human and now they're dead but but what else I so I don't rem remember, but in Firefly, in the very first episode, they were, I think they were joking about a character um, when they were in the trenches. They were joking about this guy, and then they asked about him, and, and then it turned out he was dead. So that yeah. gave right. a really cool moment right. of why this guy mattered, because these two characters obviously had a fondness for him. Exactly. So if you are writing a red shirt character... Okay, fine. Yeah, we understand that he's going to have to die in the scene. Let us know why he mattered to the people he was with. Yeah. It could be something as simple as, well, who's going to feed Patches? Yeah. You know, it, it, just a question like, oh, wow, man, he he loved that dog. What's going to go, what's going to happen? You know, something like that. Right. Because then you're, you're like, hey, oh, this guy loved his dog. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it, everybody has something that mm -hmm. makes them special to someone, to something. Every, everyone has something about them, some dream they had that, and somebody will know it. And you put that on the page and you say, okay, oh man, it, it, he was... He he had almost finished writing this short story, and he let me read the first part of it. And I, I'm never going to find out how it ends now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, something like that. Like, um, the, uh, it, it's awesome as well to, again, play with that stereotype because it's the red shirt that died or it's the stormtrooper that fell, and... If if it's a war scene, maybe somebody can be using that body for shield and see, you know, a picture of somebody taped to the inside of a boot or maybe his his hands fell fell open or something. Maybe he's got a tattoo on him of somebody yeah. that says until I return or something like that. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, the note in the pocket. Yeah, that, 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 that's, you know, that if I don't make out. it out of this, you know, give send this too, and re yeah. read that out loud. Um, yes, yeah. it's it doesn't take a whole lot of time or even effort to figure out a little bit of a personality. Maybe, maybe if again, it, maybe he's wearing a girl's necklace. Yeah. You know, maybe he's wearing something of somebody else's if it's a funny book maybe he's wearing some lace underwear and it has the girl's <laughs> name in it i don't know <laughs> yes <laughs> give him give it, him or her you know some kind of of personality with imagery or something you know it doesn't it doesn't take much yeah because if the if the character matters to one other person and the reader gets to see the person that character matters to or why that character matters, then the character will matter to the reader as well. One, you could even, because sometimes the whole point is that they were lonely and that maybe they didn't matter to anybody, but they should have. Mm -hmm. So yes. if you can find a way to show that, maybe it's it's a homeless guy that had died and, you know, 
the EMTs are there or somebody's there and they find, you know, like a, a book of stories or, or maybe a sketchbook. Yeah. And he was a brilliant artist, you know? Yeah. You can see where my mind goes to writing and art. But. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, maybe he was just from from the scraps that he managed to, to be surviving on, maybe he was also feeding a, a stray cat. And the yeah. stray cat was with him. Yeah. And wouldn't leave his side. See, it's just it's it's just all of these little tiny 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 things that that can really mean something. Exactly. Okay, so moving on from our cannon fodder. Oh, now we go to the infinitely super powered character, the character who can do everything. This is okay, this is Superman versus Batman. And um this is not just any old Batman. This is Batman. Um, oh God! And my mind has gone blank, and I can't remember the name of this series. But there's the Dark Knight. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Oh <laughs> God, I love that. I, I love. I loved the comic books. I loved the movie movies, um, because this shows Batman being vulnerable. Batman being a genuine guy who gets beat up, who gets hurt, who gets his ass kicked a bunch of times, who is in danger, and who is not invulnerable, versus Superman, whom I loathe. I he's, Yeah, he's a little bit boring. I mean, it's almost like if you took away kryptonite, this is, this is you know, Superman. Because there are different colors of kryptonite, different effects, yes. and all this and that. But Yeah, but that, that just doesn't work. Because, yeah, is if there's no... If he is... He is perfect now okay when i was four he was my first love i was absolutely certain that i was going but it was to... christopher reeves right no that was um oh no it no couldn't when have been i when was you were four, four. yeah, yeah no. it would have been when i was no four. <laughs> that was that was the first superman on tv um oh yeah yeah in black and white and he was he was a little pudgy <laughs> as a you know if you see him now oh, yeah it's like this was, but oh my God. Uh, and Barrel I was chested. out in the backyard digging a hole in the backyard because I was certain that Superman's cave was underneath our backyard. And if I could just dig down a hole, um, Superman would be there and he would be mine. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, I was four. Give me a break. Okay. It's adorable. Yes, I was absolutely in love with Superman when I was four. And okay. that showed the child's way of thinking that yes. you were absolutely sure that he was underneath your house. And if you got to him, you owned him. Yes, he would be he mine. Was yours. Was just, it was me and Superman from then on, baby. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, but I had a plan. It was not a good plan, but I had a plan. <laughs> it was a plan, damn it. Yes, it was. So, but, you know, I, he is... You can't, you, you just can't, man. Yeah, Superman in, in comic books, whatever, if that's your thing, you know, I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> but Batman in the Dark Knight was a guy with a backstory, and his backstory was born of pain, of the deaths of his parents, um, of his surviving it, of him meeting this, the guy, or of him seeing them killed. Uh, of him falling into this hole and and being terrified by bats in a cave where he, where he was trapped and didn't think he was going to be able to get out, and it's it was and then there was just so much to him, and so he had a reason for needing to get his vengeance on criminals, you know, on of needing to protect people because it was the thing he couldn't do when he was a kid. He could not protect the people who lo he loved and, and who were his life, you know, only child. Um, and he couldn't save them. So if from then on, he was, he was this kind of broken dude who had to save people. And, yeah. Um, and this is not the Adam West or if you watch um, Family no. Guy, the Adam Wee uh, <laughs> Batman, who uh, uh, reminding me. I believe I had a crush on, although I think He Man was my first true love. Yes. But um yeah, I Yeah, Batman, I remember the He Man phase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um but yeah, Batman I, I've always had a thing for, for Batman until George Clooney ruined it. But you know, but then going back into Christian Bale I had a thing for Batman. So Yeah, he was a very good Batman. 
Yeah, he really um, was. Val Kilmer was a very good Batman. And I still have the um, poster that I had above my bed of Batman, <laughs> at Val Kilmer's Batman. And apparently he's coming to the Atlanta Comic Con. And Tony said, start saving your money now. <laughs> because I, and I, I might take that beat up, folded, worn out poster and be like, tee hee, Val Kilmer. <laughs> Send my picture, please. I'll have to do a drawing of him as some character and actually give him the drawing because I don't think he's going to be like Bruce Campbell and touring all over the world and unable to take these pictures that I spent like 40 hours each on. But he signed them for free, which was pretty cool. Yeah, Yeah. so now you have an autographed. Yeah, Yeah. Bruce Campbell touched stuff I made, guys. That's amazing. (laughs) And was impressed and took a picture of it and shared it. Yeah, he shared the picture and he, yeah, so it's, um, but yeah, so anyway, the, the, um, the, the Batman that we're talking about is the real dark, you know, deep, again, the, to use the word angsty, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it's there. He's, he's this driven character. It is not the, the original Batman, um, from the comics where he's also this, just this rich dude who is a superhero because he has money to buy stuff right um a lot of people see batman that way and while i get it if you look at the character don't don't just be like oh he's got money that's that's why he's a superhero. it's not because Mm -hmm. everybody has you know everybody that has money is not a superhero everybody (laughs) that has money even that wants to be a superhero doesn't necessarily you know, it, it, you don't look at Will Smith's character in Bad Boys and think, oh, well, he's just a cop because he has money. It's like, that doesn't make any sense. He He's a cop in spite of the fact that he has money. Batman goes out at night and, and beats up ro- people robbing homeless guys or beating up homeless guys or, or robbing, you know, mothers who are, are struggling to work to feed their babies in spite of his money. Yeah. And his money helps to aid his ability to to be this badass dude right but it's not his money is not buying his muscles his money is not you know he you can't buy training you you can pay for training and you still have to put in the time and effort batman is it, superman has everything given to him everything is natural he doesn't have to train he doesn't have to fight he doesn't have to he just shoots lasers out of his eyes right. and i don't have a problem with superman i love smallville but batman has to work his ass off right and it has no superpowers and is no. vulnerable he can be hurt he can be killed yeah. bullets are not going to bounce off of him well they they are they, well he has the best toys specific, but yeah but even yeah, he's so. got the best toys he's got the best protection but it, it they can still knock him out and take off his mask. They can still knock him out and, and rip off his clothes and stab him in the heart. I mean, he is a human being and he is risking his life. Money be damned. Yeah. You know, and he would still be doing it even if he was not rich. Yeah. It's One just, of the toys breaks and he falls off the top of a building. He's dead. Yeah. He can't fly. No. <laughs> <clears throat> he, he, he can't. If he falls, he's going to break bones. Yeah. And, and the sucky thing is he can't get away from the bad guys then. So, you know, or if the bad guys are already gone, the paramedics show up. Oh, we know Batman is Bruce Wayne. Right. You know? Yeah. And he's a dude in a suit. And he's fucked. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, you know. So, <laughs> so yes. <yeah. laughs> with with your superhero, and this, this is true with a lot of... Um, more amateur writers that haven't really gotten they they see all of these cool things and they want all of these really fucking awesome things that their character can do but there is an overload and there is a point where for the reader reading that this character can do literally everything and middle of the book oh a new talent end of the book oh this talent that never even mentioned it is annoying it is unrealistic and it will distance them from the story even if your story is great they need limitations Mm -hmm. and with a superhero he needs to have one superpower one and then he needs to then have everything else be a limitation that he has this one thing he does phenomenally well with bruce wayne it's it's money and and research and development for really cool toys 
Yeah. Um, yeah, for really Well, cool. and he can fight. So, I mean, it, oh, but that's well, not a superpower. No, it's, that's it's just him this... getting the shit yeah. kicked out of him practicing and practicing and practicing yeah. and, you know, weightlifting and, and doing all of this crap to stay in shape. And... You know, yeah, they you, even showed that with Michael Keaton when Michael Keaton was all buff and stuff. He was a good Batman too. I really liked oh, I, him as a Batman. I had his poster on the wall too. Yeah. I had a huge thing for Michael Keaton when I was little. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then as a teenager, I watched Mr. Mom, and it was gone. Yeah, um, that was that was definitely <laughs> yeah. That was an awesome movie, but not the high point of his career. Oh, I love that movie. Oh, I, I think he was brilliant movie. in it, but he was definitely not Batman sexy. No, <laughs> no, that was that was a really mm. two twenty, two twenty one, whatever. <laughs> it's like oh God's forehead slap right yes. there. Yes, <laughs> but no, he's he's. It's what you're saying. You know, it's if you want to have a couple of talents that are that that match because Bruce Wayne has money so he can pay for training so he can pay for all of these toys like you said for research development building these new things that didn't exist before everything is tied together mm-hmm. but but then you know the limitations got to pop up too right right and you know he's he is not invulnerable and that's he is just a normal guy and he's aging one of the lines that i like best from the comic books is you know there are three four three ways to get a to stop this guy um and one and two and then the third one hurts and he does the third one it was just this but he was also aging and he was suffering from pain himself and you know his joints were getting stiff and he he was he hurt things hurt him even through the suits even through this stuff. it was something that made him human when reading him was that he was experiencing pain, and they, they didn't show that quite as well in the movies um, that yeah. were based off of the Dark Knight series. But, but you could see Christian Bale had some bruising and yeah, and something about a ribs. But but yeah, you're right, and it, it gives you this ability to relate to to this insanely unrealistic maybe character. Yeah, that that he wasn't in the comic books in in specifically the Dark Knight series. He was very believable and very relatable. And to do that with somebody who has been a superhero up until then was some brilliant writing. It was Frank Miller who wrote it, and God damn, he's good. I liked, um, and the more you talk about that, the more that I was thinking about Smallville, how, how it was done in this way where he was incredibly vulnerable because, yeah, he's Superman, but... He's a teenager, and up to this point, all he could do was run fast, and he was really strong. You know, those were the things that he he dealt with, and that was fine. And his parents knew he was an alien, and you know, he was he was just special in this way, until the hormones kicked in from being a teenager. Oh boy! <laughs> and then it was it was really really awesome because he's getting these talents these extra superpowers that he doesn't understand that he has just learned just now that he's, you know, noticing these things that he is an alien, you know, um, his hormones when he gets turned on, for instance, when he's got this really hot teacher, um, in science, he, that's when he learns his laser eyes work. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah that can't be good no and it's always <clears throat> this risk of him learning um of, of of these new powers he doesn't know when it's going to come he doesn't know who he's risking his life or his family's life or his friends you know because any one of these powers can expose him and his, one of his best friends is lex Luthor, who he can't trust because Lex Luthor, it's it's like there's that dichotomy of the character who both um, loves his friend Clark, but also is a power hungry kind of maniac and might use Clark. But because Clark doesn't trust him, it turns him evil. It's it's just this really really awesome storyline. I you know? never saw that. I have never seen a single episode of that show, but I knew you loved it. Oh yeah, <clears throat> a lot of my. A lot of my fan fiction showed that, <laughs> but um, 
<laughs> but it was it was really neat to see this usually annoying character that I was never really that crazy about. Even even when Christopher Reeves played him, I thought it was all right. But um, the Smallville did it to the point where he was vulnerable, not just because of all of the people around him that he cared about, but because of himself, because he couldn't control himself. He might hurt people or he might expose himself. And it was, it was just really, really well done for that kind of all powerful superhero. So that's another idea on how to make him vulnerable and, and not perfect. They, they made his abilities a limitation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And that is excellent. Okay, so let's go on to the last one of these. And this, uh, we have this as the, in quotes, selfless hero or the selfless protagonist. We need to talk for just a second here about selfless. And I have a little story about this. Um, I was with, I I was in a store and uh, was listening to a woman talk. So I don't know who this was. Uh, I, th- this, but <clears throat> she was talking about how she had, uh, given a kidney to a complete stranger, uh, that she oh, had, yeah, I remember this. Yeah. Um, that she, she had like had herself tight matched at some point, just so that at some point in her life, she could donate a kidney to someone, um, that she thought that this was a very important thing for her to be able to do. And so this, this, uh, her, her match came up and the person was a child and was like a thousand miles away. And so she, uh, flew up to the hospital where this was being done. I think they might have had her flown up, but she donated the kidney and she did, she, these were not people she knew this. She wasn't related. There was, she had no connection to them. And she was expecting that she would become there, like, like a member of the family, that she would be invited to their home, that she would be, you know, treated as, as this hero that she, but, but she said she was doing this for, for God, that she she thought that it was her duty as a Christian to donate a kidney. So that was why she was doing it. But it wasn't, she wasn't looking at this. She was, she was trying to be selfless. And she said this, she said, I thought it was my duty to do something selfless. Okay. Well, selfless means that you're not getting anything out of it. It, you don't, if, if it, if you benefit from it in any way, it's not selfless. If you feel good because of this thing you did, it's not selfless. Um, if it, and that's not a bad thing. No, that's no I, selfishness is what makes us better people. And, and you're, yeah, and you're, I know, I know. There's somebody out there. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah, well, and let me just preface this too, yeah. because a lot of people look at Buddhism as altruistic and selfless. And I know you used to be the same way. And mm-hmm. I kept trying to tell you. I kept trying to tell you, like, no. The Dalai Lama and the Buddha himself, um, when they were asked, why are you so selfless? Why do you do these things? It, and the, the Dalai Lama put it the best. He said, I do this for me. Yeah. He literally, the Dalai freaking Lama who everybody looks at, and that's why I use him as an example. He said he does this for him. He does this for the benefits that he gets by being what he thinks is a good person. And I'm not arguing he's a good person. Right. You know, but he feels these are the things that I have to do to feel better about myself. Buddha himself says, do not do what I do without question. Question everything. Look at how it makes you feel. Look at how it makes your life better. And if it does, do it. This, this is all about looking at yourself. And it, I do, quote, altruistic things all the time. I give blood all the time. I give plasma all the time. I round up people's things and money, you know, if they want to donate. And I give it to the homeless shelter. I don't do these things to be selfless. I do these things to help others and it makes me feel good. There you go. That's why I do it. Yeah. Because I feel good helping other people. 
I don't do it because society says, oh, you should do this. Oh, you should be more selfless. I can't stand the word selfless. Mm -mm. And I can't stand people saying, oh, you're being selfish because you want this life or you want these things. Yeah, that's okay. Well, this podcast, we do this podcast. It's free. It's free because we get to sit here and talk for a couple of hours every weekend about writing. And we are both writing nerds. This yes. is something we fucking love. I do this because it's fun. I do this, and, and quite frankly, I do this because I like hearing from the people who come yes. in on the forums <laughs> and go, oh my God, that was so helpful. I'm actually getting some writing done now. Um, oh my God, that helped me fix something that I was stuck on for ages. And yes, and yes there's a little bit of ego boo in there. And oh, yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. You know, that's... <laughs> but at the same time, if somebody has been resisting, let's say the timer, if somebody has been resisting the timer their entire life writing, and then, you know, they hear you talk about it and they're like, all right, fine, I'm going to make you put your money where your mouth is. And then they, they start to do the timer and they're like, holy shit, wait a minute, this actually works. <laughs> that's huge. We you have know, a bunch a of huge those win. folks. Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> yes, because Becky decided she was going to put up a 30-day challenge because I said, you know, mm -hmm. it takes about 30 days to do this for you to actually turn this into a system that will work for you. And people decided to make me put my, my <clears throat> free money where, the, yeah. where my mouth was. And they went in and they tried it. And it was like, oh, holy shit. It took about 30 yeah. days. But yeah. We've got some people on day 60 something. We've got people that made it to day 40 and then, you know, missed a day and started over. Mm -hmm. But I mean, these people are kicking my ass because, you know, I, I just started it for them. But I was going to be in there and, and share my timer every time I used it. Yeah. But I, I wasn't going in to do every single day for 30 days because I have other projects that don't require a timer i can't use a timer when i'm yes and a mom with a deadline so yeah 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 <laughs> so, so yeah i kind of took over your writing there for a while with the cover art that's fine so i i mean i could have gotten up early and still done my time and but i my priority was the cover so that was my choice yeah so the thing the problem with the selfless hero is the hero who is not doing something to get something out of it who is not doing it because the people matter to him because see you can't if you are doing something to save someone you love that's not selfless that is selfish you are doing this because you love that person and loving someone is a selfish thing you get the fact that you love them and that their life matters to you out of that relationship. Okay, so so selflessness requires that you only do things for people you don't give a shit about. It requires that or you, you only... try to give a shit about them because they're strangers. Like they're they're equal to the person you love most in life. And I just can't look at it. If I had to save a person or Tony. I don't care who that person is. I don't care what they do. I don't care. If I don't know them, I'm saving Tony. Yes. Yes, exactly. I am saving my people first. If I can then save other people, good, excellent. You yeah. Know, I got some skills in that department and uh, I'll do what I can. But, um, but no, I'm, I'm saving my people. The other problem with that, with that selfless character is when you're reading it, you get a lot of eye rolls. You, you read it and you can't relate. Right. Because you know? somebody or something matters to you. Your life matters to you. Your existence matters to you. We give a shit. It is part of being human. It is part of being able to survive on this planet. Is you have to have things that matter to you. Because without them, you, you, are, you don't exist. You have erased yourself. Yeah, and a lot of people who l try to actively try very hard to live these selfless lives if you notice a lot of them are angry and bitter mm -hmm. a lot of them are frustrated and mean and and it's it's not it's because they're not getting anything out of the work that they're doing it's because they feel unappreciated they feel and the thing is, you have to do these things for you so that that fills you up. It gives you purpose. Right. Because if you're doing it because society tells you you should be selfish and or selfless and that you should do these things and not get anything out of them and you listen and you do it, then, then your only avenue 
for feeling good is to have society praise you and tell you how wonderful you are. And when that doesn't happen enough, when you're treated like crap on days when people don't appreciate what you're doing, that's going to add up and that's going to be huge and that's going to change who you are. Right. Well, that's that woman who was behind me in line. She was bitter. She was thoroughly pissed off that these two parents who had a, a kid so, who had a dying kid who had gotten a replacement kidney, but who was still a sick, sick kid who was dealing with um, the possibility of, of transplant rejection and having to take all of these medications. And this, she didn't say this, but I knew this because I used to be a nurse you, that, nurse, that yeah. you know, uh, that you have a kid who has received a transplant. That kid is not in a social space. That kid's life is at risk. And they, you are dealing with all of these restrictions and, and things where the kid has to be kept away from strangers. And, you know, the, you're, you're thinking, okay, now this woman has done something that was a good thing, okay? It was a good thing. It saved, it's, she, she saved or at least attempted to save a kid's life because there's no guarantee that that kid survived. Yeah. Um, but... And you know the parents are grateful. They're yeah. like, who is this woman? You're amazing. Thank you so much, you know, for giving us a chance. Right. But, but they can't they can't make a stranger a part of their family because their family is in danger. Their yeah. family is is still under threat of just completely falling apart over this one kid who might still not make it, who cannot they can, they can't be in a fucking tainting, you know? Yeah. They can't look at they can't they're they're not in that space to they are looking at some of the things that are most precious to them and the risk of losing them. And this isn't about the woman who gave the kidney. No. The whole point of giving the kidney is because it's about the kid. Right. It's not about you. It's about this child and this family. And that should have been enough if, if she spent her whole life thinking that, like, okay, well, I have to be able to give a kidney because it's what I believe. Right. That should have been enough. It should have been, like, She didn't I want did it, it to be about knowing that this kid might make it she wanted it to be about her being a hero yeah and yeah yes that, but she wanted the praise for her action and mm -hmm. the the two women who were with her were going oh my god that was so wrong they shouldn't have done that they should have been <laughs> boy they should have been so grateful and you should have been it they should have made a big deal about you and i i kept my mouth shut because you know, you don't talk to people in line when they're crazy, obviously. <laughs> well, and I can understand some of it because I well, think yeah. everybody has been there to a certain extent doing something that society tells you to do. Right. Or tells you is right and you do it. And that's how we learn. Like, that's how I have learned that that it's it's you have to find your own path. Right. That you have to find the things that matter to you and go for it. And with this selfless hero character... I, I think that a lot of these are written by people who are trying to force a certain f philosophy down people's throats. Mm -hmm. And they're cr trying to create this quote-unquote perfect character that even they're not. They're, they are not like this. Every Everybody, for the most part, cannot relate to that kind of character. Right. Because, because they don't exist. Right. And, and they need to not exist. They, they need to. There is nothing good about sacrificing your own child to save the, the child of a stranger, mm -hmm. which, is, which is like the ultimate selfless act. I get nothing out of this. In fact, I am going to lose something. Um, therefore, this is good. No, this isn't good. This is a bad thing. It, yeah. it is, yeah. You have and, to fight for the things that genuinely matter for you, and you have to know what those things are. And you have to identify yeah. them, and then you write them into your fiction. It does not make you a bad person to want to save the life of somebody that you love over another person. It it would make you a bad person to take, you know, the lives of all of these these people. Yes. But that there are ways to be a good person and to give to society if that's what you want to do. Right. If it makes you feel good. But, yeah, this, this selfless hero thing is i mean if you look at some of the the biggest heroes that there that there were batman cared about his family his his parents so much that that it changed his life because right. he couldn't save them so he saves everybody because that's that's what he feels right doing right you know right stopping like, people who hurt other people 
Yeah. And that's his thing, you know, and that's valid. Yeah. And and that's that's the kind of thing Buffy Buffy was trying to protect her fa- and she never wanted to do what she was doing. But it was either that or or the world was going to end or the the hell mouth was going to open. Yeah. And she and didn't want to die. No, she didn't want to die. She didn't want her friends to die. Exactly. So she did what she had to do to protect the people that she cared about. Even the smaller character, she cared about them. Even in high school when these random people would die, if they were a teenager that she knew, it showed that moment that she knew that person, you yeah. know? So, hey, it, she was even willing to to help Cordelia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this It's just, it's an awesome... It's an awesome thing when you have a character who cares about things because it also adds that element of risk. They have things to lose. Right. So you are more invested in those characters. Right. A, a selfless character can only be a villain because they have yeah, nothing they care about and nothing to lose. So they are going to operate on those premises. They, <laughs> they are going to have nothing they care about. So they are going to do things specifically that they don't care about. That's bad. <laughs> that could be that could be really interesting making a selfless character a villain. I believe that was done in uh, the Fountainhead. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Elworth, Ellsworth Tui. Um, so okay. So is there anything else that we need to cover, or are we wrapping this one up? Uh, I think we're wrapping this one up. I think we we actually made it all the way through the rest of the characters, <laughs> much to my amazement, and probably at what somewhere under fifteen hours. So <laughs> yes, yes. Definitely under 15 this time. <laughs> yes. So, okay. So what's our takeaway? Okay. And this is the same takeaway as last week. Both your main characters and your minor characters need to step away from stereotypes to give your story depth. And minor characters need fewer points of development. You don't, you're, you want to have as much about the main character in there, what motivates them, what they fear, what they love, what they need, um, as possible in the story. You can just have one or two things about the character if they're a minor. Um, and, but, you know, we have gone through some of the things that these can be, that you can, you can flesh out a minor character just by mentioning having two characters talking about the dead one, your red shirt that didn't make it, and saying, oh, my God, who's going to take his dog? And that makes him matter to someone and something and shows that people knew him and that his life was something other than just this body that got thrown down the chute and shot. And that's, that's it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, that has been our episodes. This is part two of the 11 common stereotypes, how to make them real people. And remember again, if you have other stereotypes, uh, the, all of this applies. Yes. So uh, obviously, if you want to join in on the conversation, talk about some other stereotypes, maybe um, you know get some help or, or throw some ideas out there for the things that you're working on now, you can join our forums at hollyswritingclasses.com. It's a free account, and then you just go in and go to the podcast. Um, I am getting some some questions on the Facebook page. It, it it's a free forum it's a free account you don't have to sign up for any classes you get a free class yeah. it's um the how to write flash fiction that doesn't suck three-week course um you don't even have to use your real name if you have a pen name you can use that the the questions that i'm getting on facebook apparently people don't know like th- how to contact us other than than the facebook page it's like um <laughs> We tell you every episode, so don't worry. Yes. <laughs> you know, there's no obligation to buy anything if you create the the free account. It's just come in, come to the podcast episode uh, or forums. It's very clearly labeled podcast, um, you know, alone in a room with invisible people. And yeah, you there are a bunch of in. other free forums that you also yes. have access to when you're in there. Yeah, there's a bunch of writing forums, a bunch of free forums. The The podcast is the place you want to talk about the podcast episodes. Yes. You want to find the podcast episode that you um, want to discuss and pop in there and write some stuff. Again, Holly and I are on there pretty much daily, you know, maybe just once a day or so. But we walk, we, we pop in and we see all of the different, um, you know, stuff that's new. The forums allow us to see when somebody has posted in a forum that we haven't 
you know, been in recently. So then we can go in there and, and take a look at what you've said. Um, it, it really is the best place to have a conversation and ask some questions. And if you have questions about things, go in there and, you know, you're not just getting my opinion. You're not just getting Holly's opinion, which is the one that really, really matters to a lot of people, especially if you're listening to this, but you're also getting opinions of other writers, other listeners, other people who, who read and write and love the same thing that you do. And other opinions, a lot of these people are writing veterans, just like Holly. Yeah, they're published. So, <laughs> we, have a, yeah. we have a lot of published writers on the site. And some are self pub some are, are um, published, what, like commercially? traditional published, yeah, yeah. commercially. So y- you're really, your best bet to get, you know, any tips, tricks, help, anything like that, opinions, is to go into the forums. We do also have a Facebook page, Alone in a Room with Invisible People. We have a face- uh, an Instagram and Twitter at A-I-A-R-W-I-P. And um, you can search hashtag alone in a room with invisible people. We also have the website alone with invisible people.com and we have a Patreon. Um, so if you are interested in supporting the, the podcast on a regular monthly basis, we have three different tiers. I think it's, um, oh, I don't remember $1, $5, $10, something like that. And uh, you know, we are working on the rewards. We already have the first one that we will start in February and we are working on the other two tiers of rewards. The first one is an all tier reward. We also have a way to support the podcast, you know, once or once in a while, whenever you want to, it is at the alone with invisible people.com website. If you look on the top, right, there are three different tiers of donation levels there as well. Yeah. Just every dollar counts. Yeah. Yeah. Every every dollar counts. Every dollar makes a difference, believe me. And the fact that you guys are supporting us on Patreon is huge. Again, if you want to support Holly, you can go out and buy any of her books. You can go out and, and if you do have a specific question and do want to support her, her writing um, or her teaching, you can take a look at her shop because she has, you know, all of these different really cool courses, very specific courses, how to write dialogue, um, how to break writer's block, for instance, how to get more discipline in yourself. So, you know, obviously take a look at that, take a look at her fiction. If you want to support her on a monthly basis, she too has a Patreon. It is Holly Lyle, L-I-S-L-E on patreon.com. And she also has three tiers. And one dollar, two dollars, and five dollars. Yeah, yeah. Hers are <laughs> hers are very a lot lower than the podcasts. Yes, <laughs> just because. <laughs> but um, if you wanted to support her, you know, you can look at the tiers there. She has three different tiers, and you get a lot of really cool rewards with her system too. So um, I believe that's it. Yes, I think I put everything in. <laughs> I think so. So, <laughs> so yeah. So thank you very much for listening, and Holly. Yeah, thank you. We are delighted to be able to hang out with you every week and um, just kick some ass on your writing this week. Or, you know, if you are listening as a reader, we are putting together some stuff for you too. And we'll be doing some reader specific episodes upcoming. Uh, So, you know, just hang with us. We're getting there. And now a word from our sponsor. You want to write? You love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle, and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro. And I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.